Elton John. Let's talk about Elton John today. Wow, that guy's had such an amazing career. So many great albums, so many great hits, amazing concert performances. As you probably know, his life has been documented in the movie Rocket Man, which I haven't seen yet. But um, let's talk about his music and not so much his life. He's had so many great albums. He's recorded over 30 albums, some actually not so great. And maybe some of you need a little guidance as to which Elton John albums should I start listening to, should I start exploring. So today let's talk about the 10 best, or certainly my 10 favorite Elton John albums. My name is Rich and this channel is for people who love music. Elton John was born in England. As you may know, his given name is Reginald Dwight. And little young Reggie um, had parents who were musicians. He took a liking to the piano. He was a really adept at playing classical piano. He could hear a song. I think the famous example was a Bach uh, piece. Maybe it was Handel. I think it was Handel. He could handle it. He played it by ear perfectly just upon hearing it one time. He just kind of went back and played the thing. So obviously the guy was an immense talent. He was not a great student in music school and decided to take that path towards being a rock and roll musician. So he got involved in this band called Bluesology. He was a kind of a nerd, very conservative guy. Thought it would be cool if he wore big rimmed glasses like Buddy Holly. So he started wearing these glasses, even though his eyesight was good, he didn't need a prescription. And uh, they say it ruined his eyesight, and that's why he actually needed glasses after a while. So he's in this band, Bluesology. He's the piano player. His name is Reggie Dwight. And he's thinking, that name's not too cool. I think I need a name change to sound a little bit more like a rock musician. So in his band, there's the sax player, Elton Dean, and the vocalist, Long John Baldry. Long John Baldry never really became a huge star. He was a great vocalist. He has a really good rendition of uh, that song, um, don't try to blame no boogie woogie on the king of rock and roll or whatever it's called. It's a great song. Look it up. Check it out on Spotify. Uh, Long John Baldry. So he was a pretty cool guy. He'll come back later in this video, actually, because he did something really, really significant and important in Elton John's life. And without Long John Baldry doing this thing, um, Elton John, as we know him, probably wouldn't exist today. So Reggie's playing in this band. He's got Elton Dean on sax, Long John Baldry on vocals, gets an idea. I think I'm going to change my name. So he takes Elton Dean's first name as his first name. Long John Baldry's name is his last name and becomes Elton John. And boom, there he is um, playing in various pubs, not really making it, and decides he wants to become a songwriter. He's going to be a, a hired gun songwriter, sees an ad in NME, New Music Express, the big British music journal and replies to the ad and someone from Dick James Publishing got his application and they hooked him up with somebody else who applied for the ad, this unknown lyricist named Bernie Talpin. And that was the beginning of their incredible songwriting relationship. So Elton and Bernie actually got hooked up through this ad and they started putting some music together. And as you know, this career of them as a songwriting team and Elton as a songwriter, singer, performer, piano player, has spanned decades. So much great material to choose from. So let's get down to it. What are the 10 best, or certainly my 10 favorite Elton John albums? We'll go 10 to one. Number 10 is 111770. Now 111770 refers to the date. It's a live album. It was recorded in a, in a New York radio station on November 17th, 1970, that's the name. And if you're um, in Europe or other places in the world, they do their dates different so that you'll know that album is 17, oh, this is really confusing now, 171170, whatever the case it was recorded um, in November of 1970 with a very basic Elton John band that actually became the core of the Elton John band. It was just three pieces, Elton on piano, D. Murray on bass, Nigel Olson on drums, incredible musicians. They both had such a distinct sound that really became the Elton John sound, particularly Nigel Olson's drumming. He's got that really, I don't know how to explain it, very booming, right in your face, up front sound on the snares. And then his toms are too kind of low, like a heavy metal sound, boom, 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 boom. Just a great sound, great drummer. So, um, they came to the U.S., they did a show at the Troubadour in L.A., and then flew over to New York and did this radio station show. And I don't think it was meant to become a record. 
But since it was broadcast on the radio, it was very heavily bootlegged. And the record company thought we better put this album out. People are buying it anyway. This could become a great opportunity to earn some money and expose more people to Elton John. So uh, 11, 17, 70 comes out. Just a super energetic three guys really made so much noise. I think they laid the groundwork for uh, Ben Folds 5, which also had the same lineup, piano, uh, bass, and drums. Um, some fantastic songs in there. Take Me to the Pie, a little beautiful version. Um, really a super cool cover version of Honky Tonk Woman. Um, they start a cappella, just the three of them singing the chorus, Honky Tonk Woman. And when you hear it, you'll notice all three of them, obviously we know Elton can sing, but Dee Murray and Nigel Olsen, really had great voices too. They were fantastic harmonizers. And that sound of those guys providing harmony also became a distinct feature of the Elton John, John sound. Um, There's just a blistering 18 minute version of Burn Down the Mission to close the album. Elton even throws in some snippets of, of Get Back by the Beatles. So it's a super energetic, um, not a real long album. I think it's seven songs, but never gives up in its energy saw what a great live performer he was and his voice and his piano playing wow so if you love live albums that's a great place to start it's my 10th favorite elton john album 11 17 70. number nine a record that i think is kind of unheralded is called rock of the westies a little play on west of the rockies because this album was recorded at uh james william gercio studio caribou studios at a ranch i think it was in Arizona, Colorado, somewhere out there, west of the Rockies, Rock of the Westies. Um, and Elton is, was hugely popular when this album came out. And I feel like everything he did was met with so much um, criticism and analysis. It's almost like he couldn't win. And I think this album, I, I don't really feel got a fair shake. Um, he was using a different band, back to some old guys that he played with, Roger Pope on drums, Caleb Quay on guitar. They're really from the old, old, old days. Um, an American dude, Kenny Passarelli on bass. You've probably heard his work before. He did some great stuff with Hall and Oates. I think he did a little bit with NRBQ at one time. So a great bass player there. Now, the big hit off Rock of the Westies, and really not a song I care for at all, is Island Girl. Just a kind of a silly pop ditty, really lightweight. Um, some people would even say racist. Just not a great song, even though it was a pretty significant hit. And I think maybe the album was judged by that. But there's some, actually some pretty heavy stuff on this album. It really bordered on heavy metal, really thick guitar. The opening track, I love. It's a medley. Um, Yell Help, Wednesday Night. Kind of McCartney-esque, I think, the way the songs blend into one another and the themes keep repeating. So that's one of the highlights. A great song called Hard Luck Story. Feed Me is another very heavy-ish kind of song. So try to get past Island Girl and try to get past the maybe lukewarm reviews and give Rock of the Westies a spin. I think you'll really, really enjoy it. Uh, it plays through, as I would say. Okay, number eight best Elton John, or my eighth favorite Elton John album, is called Caribou. It was recorded in the same studio. Uh, it was his first attempt. It was recorded before Rock of the Westies. Um, Caribou, again, great album. The big hit, two big hits. Um, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, pretty typical, great Elton John ballad, and a little rockier and heavier, The Bitch is Back. That's a great song. That's a real biting song. So those are the two hits. Uh, but the album also has some really beautiful, softer, mellower songs. Um, Pinky, Grimsby, those are both really great songs. It's got a uh, kind of Southern New Orleans type song called Dixie Lily, which is great. Uh, gets a bit heavier with You're So Static, fantastic song. The highlight of the album for me is a song called Ticking. It's the album closer. It's a long song, seven minutes or so, very somber. It's just Elton on piano. There's a little bit of synth there. I'm not sure who played that. Um, and it's a, just a horrible story about a mass shooting in a bar um, before mass shootings were, unfortunately, sadly, everywhere. Um, just a very... Uh, sad and harrowing song, even a little tough to get through at times, but it really showcases Elton's brilliant piano, his great singing, Bernie's incredible lyrics. I, I think you'll find that the highlight, of the highlight of the album. It's called Ticking. Okay, number seven, number seventh best Elton John album, or my seventh favorite Elton John album. I have a feeling many people will disagree with this one because many people consider this to be Elton John's best album, and it's his eponymous album, not his eponymous debut, although in the United States we thought it was. It's just the album called Elton John. This was his first release 
in the US. Now, if you were a UK fan, um, or maybe a really big Elton John fan, you know that before the Elton John, Elton John album came out, he had an album called Empty Sky, never released in the US until he was already famous. Didn't really go many places, pretty rough, raw. I really enjoyed it, you probably would too. Um, really can't place into the top 10 Elton albums, but it's got some great stuff in there, especially Skyline Pigeon, one of his finest songs. But my seventh favorite, and again, many people's number one favorite is the eponymous US debut called Elton John. It was supposed to be demos apparently, but the material is so great, they decided to make it an actual album. Um, he's working with his, his producer, Gus Dudgeon, who went on to become kind of his signature producer. Um, one of the things that I think really brings this album down is also one of the reasons a lot of people like it. The string arrangements by the great Paul Buckmaster, I think they're really heavy, heavy handed, almost overbearing. The strings are great, but after a while, geez, it's like they're, they're just everywhere. You can't, you can't lose those strings. Um, of course, the big hit from this album is Your Song. His breakthrough hit in the U.S., just a beautiful classic, any way you slice it. A uh, Border Song is also on this album. Holy Moses, you might know that as. Um, not really a hit, although they did put it, put it on the first Elton John's Greatest Hits album. Just a great gospel-type song. You gotta love Border Song. Um, Take Me to the Pilot, we all know that one. Great Elton Rocker, The King Must Die. A really cool song on there called No Shoestrings on Louise, which is kind of an homage to the... Um, Country sounding Rolling Stones. I, I love the cut Rolling Stones country type things. I'm, um, you know, on the Baker's Banquet album or Dead Flowers or maybe Sweet Virginia off of Exile. Uh, Mick and Keith really could do a great country sounding song. And No Shoestrings on Louis sounds just like one of those. So great, great album. Seventh best Elton album. The eponymous US debut, just called Elton John. Okay, number six is Madman Across the Water. Again, this is a little bit bogged down by the heaviness in those string arrangements, but wow, side one of Madman Across the Water. You'd be hard pressed to find a better album sign than that. It opens with Tiny Dancer, the song everybody loves, then goes to Levon, kind of in the same vein as Tiny Dancer. Um, Razor Face, not quite as famous, but also in the same vein, great song. And then the title cut the haunting, scary almost, Madman Across the Water. Now there's a, another version of Madman Across the Water done with Mick Ronson on guitar. It's about eight minutes long. It's even creepier, but the album version is great. Just perfect. Side two, I think maybe not quite as strong, um, but that's, uh, you know, that's why it's only number six. Um, D and Nigel, D Murray on bass and Nigel Olson on drums are actually on this album on a second side song called All the Nasties. Great song, Indian Sunset, which opens the second side. I'm not a huge fan of, I think it's kind of boring and dreary. Elton loves it, he's playing it on his um, farewell tour, so he must love that one, but didn't quite do it for me. Anyway, fantastic album, number six, Man Men Across the Water. Fifth best, or my fifth favorite Elton John album is Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player. Classic title, supposedly um, he came up with that title after a night of ribbing by Groucho Marx. Groucho was kind of joking around with him, maybe giving him a little bit too hard of a time. And um, Elton says, hey, don't shoot me, I'm only the piano player, which became the cover of the album. It's a big movie marquee. It says, don't shoot me, I'm only the piano player, starring Elton John. And there's actually a, a Marx Brothers poster in the window or on the wall of the movie theater. So maybe a little tribute to that exchange. Um, Kind of a continuation of Honky Chateau, in my opinion. Somewhat similar sound. We'll get to Honky Chateau soon. It was recorded in France in that big chateau. Um, the big hits are Daniel, of course, Elton John classic. Um, Crocodile Rock, a little cheesy and campy, not my favorite, but it was a huge hit nonetheless. Um, and then, of course, Blues for Baby and Me and High Flying Bird, or I feel the two highlights. Again, songs that maybe, um, if you just know Elton John on the surface, you aren't familiar with. They're both kind of big slow, emotional songs, really, really great songs. Um, Blues for Baby and Me and High Flying Bird. This album featured the traditional Elton John band, Nigel Olsen on drums, Dee Murray on bass. Really, really great stuff. Okay, number four, fourth best, or my fourth favorite Elton John album is Honky Chateau. Honky Chateau um, predates Don't Shoot Me, but recorded in the same place a chateau in France. I wonder if, um, like many other British musicians, the Stones specifically, they were in France as kind of tax exiles because the taxes were so high in England. I suspect that was the case. Um, but this again had his core band. This one introduced 
Davey Johnstone on guitar, who became Elton's lifelong guitar player, really great signature guitar sound, huge member of the Elton John band. And there's a weird sound on this album. If you're wondering what that, it's kind of almost sounds like a synthesizer, almost sounds like somebody playing the saw, it's just a really bizarre sound. That is the electric violin being played by the great Jean-Luc Ponty. I don't think he was playing it on Desolation Row, but he was certainly playing it in the Chateau in France. So you know the two hits well, Honky Cat, that New Orleans kind of bluesy, funky, great song. And of course, one of his most famous hits, the great, great, great song, Rocket Man. They named the, the movie after it. So, wow, we all love Rocket Man, but so many other great songs on this album. Um, kind of soulful, almost gospely, mellow, Salvation, Slave, a great upbeat, really great rocker called Amy, which features Nigel's drumming just fabulously. Um, there was a song called Hercules, which was almost a single. I'm not sure why they never released it. I think it would have done well. Cat Named Hercules, just a great song. And my favorite on the album, maybe a little bit of a sleeper, is Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's. Just a beautiful song, been covered by many people. If you haven't heard that song, you absolutely owe it to yourself to check out Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's from my fourth favorite Elton John album, Honky Chateau. Okay, I was gonna say we're really getting into rarefied air here, but I think once we get to um, number seven, the eponymous US debut, they're all classics. Any one of these, you can make an argument for being Elton's best album. The Elton John album, Mad Men Across the Water, Don't Shoot Me, Honky Chateau, all great. Number three of my favorites, I know is an album that many consider his best, and that is the double album, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Um, came out in 1973, I believe. I'm not really that good with dates, but I remember this one came out in 1973. I'll paint the picture for you. Um, it came out in late 73. I was born in 58, so I was 14 when this came out, about to turn 15. Already a huge Elton John fan. I had these friends, um, Abby and Stacy Zlotnick, the Zlotnick twins, and they were humongous Elton fans. And I remember um, they were so excited this new Elton John album was coming out. They went to the store and bought it the day it came out, or Dico, as we call it in our family parlance, D-I-C-O, day came out. That was a big deal in those days. You got the album the day it came out. You didn't know what to expect. There weren't any advanced singles, I don't believe. And we all went over to their apartment and peeled off the shrink wrap and sat around their tiny little crappy portable record player. Nobody, you know, we were teenagers. Nobody had good stereos in those days. Maybe every now and then you could use um, the hi-fi that your parents had if that was decent. It could have been one of those big wooden consoles with the TV in it. Those were great. Um, I certainly didn't have a good stereo. Just had a, a mono unit hand-me-down from my grandmother called an Epsi Overture. It had one of those continuous tone controls. It didn't have a treble and a bass control. It just had one called tone. So all the way to the left was real bassy. All the way to the right was real trebly. You kind of had to find your balance somewhere in between. Okay, so I remember we, we put on this record, looking at the cover, we really hadn't seen the glitzy, flamboyant, overblown Elton John yet. And on this cover, he's all out. He's wearing the high heels and the, I don't know, the dime, whatever it is. He just looks crazy. And not an Elton John we really knew yet. Not knowing what to expect, so we put on side one. Remember, it's a double album, side fours, four sides. Put on side one, and it starts with this like, this weird wind, and these bells are chiming. And the song is called Funeral for a Friend. It's like, what's going on there? And it starts with this very somber organ, very haunting. It does sound like a funeral. And the whole song's instrumental, and it starts getting heavier and heavier and heavier, and we're all listening, thinking like, what is this? Is, this isn't the Elton John we know, he's not even singing. And the song just, it, it just sucks you in, and then all of a sudden it segues with the incredible Love Lies Bleeding, and it's like, wow. Everybody was just blown away. And Funeral for a Friend in the Love Lies Bleeding remains one of Elton's, if I could even make the argument that's his greatest recording. Funeral for a Friend into Love Lies Bleeding. He used that to open concerts for many, 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 many years. And the hits on this album, the title song, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, uh, Benny and the Jets, Candle in the Wind, Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, those are all great hits. They don't even tell the story. So many other um, great songs. Gray Seal, Harmony, this song has no title. All the Girls Love Alice, a real rocker about a uh, older gay woman courting younger girls. Wow, really taboo 
subjects for 1973. Great, great album. A lot of people think this is their favorite, and I wouldn't argue with you. It's not my favorite. I just think there are too many kind of mid-tempo songs that are great, but they're just not up to that level. Songs like um, Roy Rogers, or I've seen that movie too. I mean, I loved all these songs, still do, but they just don't keep up. The, now, some people would say this should have been a single album. I'm not sure I would agree with that. I think keeping it as a double was the right move, but maybe that also is its downfall. And in my opinion, not why it's Elton John's number one greatest album. Okay, what's Elton's second best album? You think you know what it is? You think you know what I'm gonna say? Um, well, this is an album that I think not as many people understand. Maybe you could say it wasn't from his classic, classic, classic period, but wow, is this album unbelievable. Uh, and that is Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. It was his last, and he had already gone full glitz, crazy, flamboyant, um, Captain Fantastic, which I know turned a lot of people off, but don't let that scare you. This album is amazing. It's his last album with the classic Elton John band. I think he came back to the band much, much later in his career, but as far as his, you know, kind of early to mid period, this is his last album with Nigel Olson on drums, who does an incredible job. Um, Davy Johnstone on guitar, D. Murray on bass. It's a concept album. Bernie wrote the lyrics about their early days when they met each other and were frustrated. Songwriters didn't think they'd go anywhere, the struggles that they had, and it is just amazing. Not only is every song great, every single moment on this album is great. It starts with that incredible title cut, Captain Fantastic. Just listen to it with headphones, the sound is amazing the story is amazing the performance of the musicians and it continues all the way through bitter fingers um features what i feel is probably davy johnstone's best guitar work meal ticket really cranks it up uh, better off dead writing these are all incredible songs the big hit from this album was someone saved my life tonight that's probably my least favorite song on the album but what a great song it tells the story of when elton was engaged to a woman who he didn't love and he was you know, worried he'd be paying her HP demands forever, what that means. And his friend Long John Baldry talked him out of it. And we all know, obviously, marrying a woman wasn't something that uh, fit into Elton's life. And, and, you know, he could have been trapped in this bad marriage. So that song tells the story of that. Just really, really touching song. One of my favorite moments of the album is the closing. It's got two closing songs that segue into one another. Um, we all fall in love sometimes into curtains. I think maybe overlooked songs on this album. What a way to finish the album and the story of Elton and Bernie. Just breathtakingly beautiful. So my second favorite, I think second best Elton John album is Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. So what is the best Elton John album? The best Elton John album, well, in my opinion, it's the incredible Tumbleweed Connection, his second US album, third album in the UK. Tumbleweed Connection is a really odd album. First of all, it has no hits. Secondly, it's a concept album of sorts. Um, it's tales of the American West and the Civil War. It's a real Americana album. And they say that when Bernie started writing the lyrics and Elton started the music, they had not even been to the US yet. They were just these young guys kind of imagining the cowboy world, the horrible Civil War, all these things, and came up with an album that is just start to finish, incredibly outstanding. I don't even want to single out specific songs because I just want to say this is an album that you have to experience start to finish. You'll feel like you're in the Old West. And Elton's voice is so powerful. His piano playing, so incredible. You know, I, I um, grew up as a piano player. I started playing piano when I was six. I started playing guitar when I was in college. But piano was my instrument. And, you know, to a kid like that, so I'm 9, 10, 11, 12, really getting into rock and roll. And all the big rock stars were either guitarists or vocalists, you know, McCartney played the bass, obviously, but he was a vocalist, he played guitar from time to time too. And there weren't really that many piano players who were big rock stars. And I think Elton changed all that. He was the front man who was also a piano player. His playing was incredible, just that blend of rock and classical and funk and got those little New Orleans touches in there and some jazz, some boogie woogie, just amazing. In my opinion, he set the stage for all the great piano players to come, Billy Joel, Ben Folds. I don't think any of them would have been who they are without Elton John. So 
and, and a lot of that you can hear on this album. And it's not just piano. There's great guitar work. There's some songs where the piano is really in the background. There's some amazing acoustic songs. I mean, Come Down in Time has got to be one of his absolute most beautiful, quiet love songs. There's a song in there called Love Song, which Elton and Bernie didn't even write. It's by Leslie Duncan, one of the few um, covers that they've done of a song that wasn't already famous. So just great stuff start to finish. I mean, Ballad of a Well-Known Gun, Country Comfort, Where To Now, St. Peter. Again, I said I wasn't going to name specific songs, but here I am doing it for Tumbleweed. So since we went there, probably the two best songs, um, Burn Down the Mission, super famous Elton, Piano Workout, the 18-minute version on um, 11, 17, 70 is fabulous. Probably my favorite song, if I had to pick one, well, my second favorite, let's say that, would be My Father's Gun. Um, it's got that ending where it just keeps repeating the same thing over and over again, kind of Hey Judish. It just keeps building up and building up. But if I had to pick a favorite song on this album, it would be Amarina. Now, Amarina is the song that if somebody just landed here from Mars and said, hey, what's Elton John sound like? That's a pretty tough question to answer. I would put on Amarina. I have incredible memories of going to see the movie Dog Day Afternoon, the Al Pacino movie, I think around 1975. Um, and for some reason, I have no idea why they chose to open the movie when the opening credits were playing, the song Amarina is on. And it was in a big, beautiful old movie theater. I'd never heard a stereo or sound system as good as the one in this movie theater before. And the movie starts and Amarina is just pumping through these incredible speakers. It was like, oh, M, G, I've never heard the song sound so good before. But honestly, Amarina would sound good on any kind of sound system. It would sound good through, uh, through AirPods. I don't care where you listen to it. Listen to Amarina. Again, that's my song that if somebody said, what's Elton John sound like? Well, geez, he's been around for decades. He's got 30 albums. How can you pick one song? That would be the one I pick. So uh, Tumbleweed Connection, my favorite, and I think the best Elton John album of all time. I'd love to hear your comments. What do you think? What's your favorite Elton John album of all time? Maybe you think Elton John sucks. I don't If you do, um, or if you're thinking I'm just not into that kind of music, I would highly recommend going back and giving him a listen. Also, if you like what you're hearing, subscribe to my channel, wherever that button is. Subscribe. We'd love to have you subscribe. Um, this channel is for people who love music. It doesn't matter if you know a lot about music. It doesn't matter if you're an accomplished musician or if you feel like you know nothing about music, but you just love listening to it. This channel is for you. So, hey, my name is Rich. Thanks for being with me. And I hope that you're going to go play some Elton John right now. Probably one of these 10 albums. See you soon.